Good afternoon, Europe, and good morning, North America. Dear participants, on behalf of the Stockholm Environmental Law and Policy Center and the Baltic Sea Center, I welcome you to this webinar on law and governance in the Baltic Sea and the Chesapeake Bay. I'm Jonas Ebbeson, Professor of Environmental Law, Director of Stockholm Environmental Law and Policy Center, and former Dean of the Faculty of Law. I have the pleasure of opening and of moderating this seminar. We are very excited by the great number of participants on both sides of the Atlantic. We have about 150 participants, about 60 from Sweden, about 60 from the United States, and then participants from about 10 other countries. So, every cloud has a silver lining. In this case, the coronavirus situations has forced us into using webinars and video conferences. And in doing so, we see that we can actually organize events in a way we usually don't do. For us, this is the first transatlantic webinar. And as I said, we are glad to see the response. When organizing this seminar, we thought that if this is successful, we may continue with more transatlantic webinars. And whether we do so or not depends also on your views. So please respond after this seminar on what you think. Moving on to the program, the theme of this seminar is law and governance of the two marine areas of the Baltic Sea and the Chesapeake Bay. The two key speakers, Rita Buman and Lara Fowler, will present to you the situation in the two marine areas. Rita Buman is a senior lecturer in environmental law at the Department of Law at Stockholm University. She has been postdoc researcher in ocean governance law at the University of Gothenburg. In 2017, she was also a researcher at Baltic Area Legal Studies at Turku Academy University in Finland. In 2017, she finalized her PhD thesis on the topic Transboundary Law for Social Ecological Resilience, a study on eutrophication in the Baltic Sea, which was an evaluation of the regulatory framework on land-based pollution and eutrophication in the Baltic Sea area. Lara Fowler is a senior lecturer at Penn State Law and the assistant director of the Penn State Institutes of Energy and the Environment. In addition, she serves on the Chesapeake Bay Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee. She was a Fulbright Scholar at Uppsala University's Peace and Conflict Research Department from 2019 to 2020, exploring where people are finding success in managing difficult water challenges, including a comparison of the Baltic Sea and the Chesapeake Bay regions. So we have two highly qualified speakers to enlighten us about law and governance for the protection of the marine environments of these two areas. But why compare these two areas in the first place? To be sure, the Baltic Sea and the Chesapeake Bay are not the only marine regions in the world facing environmental stress. In fact, in addition to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which has global coverage and about 170 parties, but not the United States, in addition to this global treaty, there are regional sea conventions applicable to a number of sea areas. For instance, the Northeast Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, the west coast of Latin America, the west coast of Africa and the east coast of Africa, the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, the South Pacific region and the Black Sea. So in all legal contexts, it's useful to compare how situation works in one area and how it works in another. And by comparing these legal frameworks and these regimes, we can learn from one another. And from the viewpoint of law and governance, there are both similarities and differences between the Baltic Sea and the Chesapeake Bay. In the Baltic Sea area, there are several jurisdictions involved. There are also several uh, legal frameworks applicable at different levels, at international law, European Union law, and the national laws of the states concerned. In the Chesapeake Bay, while there is not so much of international law involved, there are also several jurisdictions concerned and overlapping legislation at different levels with federal laws and state laws. Key questions for this seminar are how effectively these areas are governed in terms of managing serious environmental problems. 
Both speakers will pay particular attention to the concerns with nutrients and eutrophication. How effective are the applicable legal frameworks and the competent institutions, whether national or international, to deal with these matters? I will now give the virtual floor to my colleague, Professor Christoph Hamburg, who is the scientific director at the Baltic Sea Center. In addition to a few words on behalf of the Baltic Sea Center, he will brief us about the relevance of comparing the two marine areas from a scientific perspective and the characteristics of the two areas. After Christoph, I will invite first Britta and then Laura to speak, and I will then open up for comments and discussions, and participants will be invited to comment and ask questions. When invited to speak, please make brief and clear comments or put questions to the speakers. So once again, much welcome. And now I give the floor to Christoph Hamburg. Thank you, Jonas. So my name is Christoph Hamburg. I'm professor in biogeochemistry here in uh, Stockholm University, and I'm a scientific head of the Baltic Sea Center. I will say just a few words about the Baltic Sea Center, introduce what we do, and then uh, give my view on, on this webinar, which I think is, a, is, is an excellent way to communicate over the ponds. So uh, what I will try to do now is that we, uh, I share my screen. And I hope everybody can see this now. Yes, can everybody see that? Great, so uh, this, we are Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center and uh, our main mission is to initiate or coordinate research here at, at the Stockholm University. And we have uh, mainly uh, three foci of our work. The first is uh, to, to, to provide infrastructure and some of you maybe also from the US have been to the wonderful field station at ASKU. And here we have also a brand new research vessel, Electra. And this is what we facilitate our uh, fellow scientists here at Stockholm University, but also scientists from abroad. Then we have also the mission of communicating and also a policy group here. And here we develop the so-called Baltic Eye approach, which goes a little bit beyond the normal, let's say, communication. Because what we do here is that we tailor uh, uh, information for decision makers, for politicians. And our policy group helps us to define policy processes where we can make our input at the right place and the right time and help really decision makers uh, uh, with, with scientific advice. And then uh, finally, we have an analysis and synthesis group. And here we have about 27 researchers. Half of them are doing this kind of analysis synthesis, helping the communicators and policymakers, drafting policy briefs. And the other half is, is a group of modelers. And I think we had also exchange here. This is the Baltic Nest Institute, uh, about 10 modelers that, would, that had exchanged before with the Chesapeake Bay group. And what they do, they have a regional uh, system model that is heavily used also in the HELCOM process for eutrophication management. And we have calculated the, the, the load reductions that are needed to, to, to uh, meet the environmental goals as formulated by, the, by HELCOM and the Baltic Sea Action Plan. So this is a little bit, the, in a nutshell, what we do. We may compare us a little bit with the which has a big research consortium that you have in Annapolis. I think I visited this place uh, twice. But of course, you are seven US states and we do that within the, the Stockholm University. But, uh, but again, our, our mission is to coordinate and initiate research. Okay, then I don't know why I... Okay, then um, to the next point, why comparing Chesapeake Bay and, and, and the Baltic Sea? These are completely different different coastal systems. I would say the Chesapeake Bay is, is, is a classical estuary, and whereas the Baltic Sea is an entire regional sea. And uh, here I don't will, will read all these numbers, but you can say also in scale, the, the, the Baltic Sea is much larger. And also the water residence times in the Chesapeake Bay is just half a, half a year, and in the Baltic Sea is just 30 years or something like that. Why to compare them? And I think um, there is this interest because both of these, these, these systems became the iconic poster childs for eutrophication on both sides of the pond, in the US, the Chesapeake Bay, and in Europe, the, the Baltic Sea, with also some kind of blueprint function for 
marine management approaches. And I could say here at least in, in, U, in Europe that the Baltic Sea Action Plan became a blueprint for the, for the Marine Strategy Directive. And this is, is, is not only developed for the Baltic Sea, of course, also for the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, and other seas. So they looked very much to what we have done here in, uh, in the Baltic Sea region, how scientists have uh, cooperated with managers and politicians to, to put forward the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And I think a similar role uh, you guys have, have, uh, have had in, in, in uh, the, um, the Chesapeake Bay. And um, what I, uh, here are uh, uh, prominent reports uh, that uh, both uh, scientists and, and, and uh, uh, um, people working at, at the administration agencies put forward. This is the, the HOLAS, the, the, the holistic assessment, and then also the Chesapeake Bay total maximum daily load approach. Uh, in brackets, I can say I envied all the time the, 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 the scientists in the, um, in the US that had this high accuracy that they really could give a total maximum daily load. I think we, on this other side of the pond, were a little bit more modest. We, 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 our approach is maximum allowable input, and this is then the then annual uh, uh, load. But the, the, the approach to it is very similar. So we have a bunch of researchers and then also a bunch of modelers that, that, that uh, try to, to closely co co cooperate with uh, the, the policy side to, to develop these, 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 these strategies. And in, in both these reports, if you read mm. them in detail, and many of you have done so, I think the conclusion is that we have achieved a lot but we are not already there. We are, we are not fully there. We, we, we still have to do something more. And uh, that's why I think it is very important that we, we, we discuss the, the governance aspects of it. So to, to really discuss today, how much have we achieved already? What, what, did, what did work, what didn't? And here we really need input from law sciences. And, and, and I think that's why I appreciate also the first seminar of this, uh, hopefully a series, is dealing with that. And now I will close with, with a wish, I would say. I discussed uh, that we should have more exchange with, with uh, Don Bosch a lot. And uh, I think uh, now in these corona times, these exceptional times made it, forced us now to, to go other ways. And maybe this webinar is now a, a beginning of a, of a wonderful series of, of seminars that we continue and let's, let's evaluate how, how this unfolds today, but I'm pretty optimistic that we can do a series of these kind of, of, of uh, seminars and baby mass in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, and I fully agree with you on, well, on, on, in particular on the last point, but of course on what you say. Thank you. It was very useful uh, presentation to get the sense of the context geographically and, and otherwise. So now based on this, I will give the floor to Britta Bowman to give an overview of Baltic Sea governance, please. Thank you. My presentation will be about the problem of eutrophication and some different perspectives on the compliance in the Baltic Sea area. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, and I'll try to just give a brief um, presentation of what this, um, what the governance and the legal governance especially has accomplished so far and, and generally in an overarching perspective on uh, compliance and particularly perhaps incentives for compliance and how these have changed over time in the Baltic Sea. Uh, so I will start or along the way also present these changes in the regulatory framework. Many of you are probably already uh, familiar with these, but um, I have to sort of show them to you to also be able to discuss and explain what I can see from my research, how compliance and incentives for compliance have changed along with this development. And even if I don't um, mention agriculture and diffuse sources, uh, I was meaning first to have sort of an historical development of how far we've come and how much we've done with point sources and so on, but the time is too too short uh, to do that. So instead, um, I'll go right to more where we are today. And then, of course, diffuse sources and especially diffuse sources from agriculture is 
one of my, our main problems in the Baltic Sea. So before going into the regulatory framework, uh, this I think perhaps is the same picture that Christoph just showed, but for you that are not familiar with the Baltic Sea area, so this is uh, the sea, it's in the northern Europe. Um, we are nine uh, coastal states that share this sea. And this is the drainage area, so you can see that there are also many states that, or a couple of states that uh, are not coastal states, but they still are part of the drainage area, which of course also affects the governance situation. And so, and the Baltic Sea is also divided into different basins, so measures taken and regulation also affects are affected by where this where the uh, discharges comes out in in what part of the um, sea this is the baltic proper which is the part of the baltic sea that is mostly affected by eutrophication or the worst part of uh, affected and so this is sweden and here is stockholm where i am uh, giving this presentation to you. Uh, very nice to have so many listeners from so many um, parts of both this region and, and from the United States. Um, so this is a picture, just a schedule for uh, or a map over the different kind of um, legal frameworks that we have in the Baltic Sea area. As Jonas mentioned, it is um, a very uh, multi-level <laughs> governance system, but mainly it's a regional sea, so the main uh, um, regulatory framework is, of course, uh, the, the Sea Convention of uh, the Baltic Sea uh, for the protection of the Baltic Sea environment, uh, the Helsinki Convention, and it was first adopted by the coastal states already in 1974. So we have more than 40 years of uh, legal governance and governance cooperation in this area. Uh, and together with the convention was also the Helsinki Commission adopted uh, or established as the administrative organization for this convention. Um, the convention was revised in 1992. Um, it's not great difference to the or the main differences in its provisions were the addition of a number of environmental law principles such as precautionary principle, um, polluters pay principle, um, best available technique, best environmental practice and so on. So this is also very much the character of this uh, convention. It's got a rather vague uh, provisions but um, then um, based on a lot of principles and sort of a general uh, aim or general objective. And that is also why these um, additional annexes and recommendations, for example, are very important because they define a lot of what um, the convention aims to do or what how we should interpret the convention. So a lot of examples, for example, best environmental practice in agriculture is defined more precisely what that means in annexes when it comes to the use of fertilizers or um, the amount of animals in a farm and so on is, is much more clearly defined in the annexes and the annexes are also binding. Um, it's clearly stated in the convention that the annexes are binding. The recommendations are not particularly binding, but you should also, as a state, uh, report on what you do in relation to the recommendations that the Healthy Helcom uh, um, uh, publishes. And then we have the Baltic Sea Action Plan, which of course is a very important, even more important part of uh, defining this, what uh, states should do. And I will get back more to what the Baltic Sea Action mean plan means because that has also sort of changed the focus and the governance approach in the Baltic Sea. And so one other thing that was very significant when we adopted the new Helsinki Convention is that uh, in addition to the coastal states, um, the EU also became a party to the Helsinki Convention or the European Union. Uh, so when the European Union becomes party to a convention, 
they must, just like any con other contracting parties, also uh, implement the provisions of the convention. And the AU does that through uh, adopting legal acts of its own. So the main legal acts within the EU legal system are the Water Framework Directive and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And they are then corresponding to the convention and to the other um, parts of the convention provisions, the Baltic Sea Action Plan and the annexes and recommendations. So, um, and given that all parties except Russia are also uh, parties or member states to the EU, this creates a very unique situation because then most of these coastal states are not only bound by obligations within the con uh, convention framework, but they are also bound by EU law. And of course, the role of EU in this region and how this division between EU and HELCOM has developed has also created a very special situation, uh, giving a lot of room for HELCOM to focus on certain issues while EU, perhaps uh, with stronger enforcement, have uh, taken on another role uh, in this cooperation. And I will talk more about this, but it's also a very unique connection between the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the Baltic Sea Action Plan. So um, this also affects then the fact that states are bound by both of them. Uh, just briefly, uh, to also reflect when we discuss compliance, uh, the general aim of the Helsinki Convention is for the contracting parties to take all appropriate, leg take all appropriate legislative, administrative or other relevant measures to prevent and eliminate pollution and furthermore in the same article it is stated that if uh, reduction of inputs resulting from the use of best environmental practice and best available technology uh, as described in annex 2 does not lead to environmentally acceptable results additional measures shall be applied now just the first uh, of appropriate measures and this illustrates uh, a lot of the complexity in discussing even compliance in, in when it comes to this kind of requirements. I'll not go too much into that because perhaps it's, it's more uh, relevant to talk on what's actually going on, but I think it's worth at least reflecting on that when we discuss compliance to ask what is compliance because appropriate measures are a very vague statement. And here we have first an illustration of the use of annexes in this convention. A lot of the convention provisions are, as I mentioned, defined through the annexes. So the annexes and recommendations are very important in the interpretation of the requirements. And now we also have the Baltic Sea Action Plan. And so the Baltic Sea Action Plan mainly answers both the question of what is acceptable results and what is additional uh, measures that should be applied. Um, acceptable results must be reflected in the goals of the Baltic Sea Action Plan and of course the Baltic Sea Action Plan also have taken us a big step forward in defining what, not what the additional measures are because we still don't define precisely what measures the state shall take but a lot of uh, additional uh, guidance to the states and uh, of course with the uh, certain targets for eutrophication will also make the level of uh, ambition for the states very clear at least. Um, a difference here for those who don't know about the EU uh, legal system, HELCOM is based uh, mainly on self-reporting. The contracting parties shall report to help HELCOM on inter alia measures taken and the effectiveness of measures taken. And HELCOM has no competence to act on no non-compliance. And that's why the additional uh, role of the EU in this area is very important because EU has a much stronger uh, system for enforcement through the EU Commission and the EU Court. Um, so the, it's possible for the EU to uh, lead the way in the enforcement and this is also why HELCOM now is given sort of leaving bits of the enforcement to EU and then focusing more on perhaps bilateral pro pro projects with 
non-parties um, that are part of the drainage area or with Russia who are not an EU state and so um, can compensate for this uh, imbalance, which is, for, of course, from a governance perspective, a very important uh, aspect. Uh, so um, to take a jump into where we are today and this change in legal approaches, I'll not go into the details of any of these uh, frameworks, um, but I think the main point here for me is that I want to explain this change that was started with EU adopting the Water Framework Directive in the year 2000, where we went to a more um, goal achieving uh, perspective, which is also reflected in the Baltic Sea Action Plan with the ecosystem approach, um, taking on programs of, of measures and uh, having this system for uh, adaptive um, evaluation of measures taken. And of course, the EU uh, Water Framework Directive is not directly significant for the marine areas of the EU, but of course, what goes on, on land, uh, EU, uh, the Water Framework Directive is applicable to inland water, and so the measures taken on land will, of course, also affect what happens in the marine waters in the end. And another significant uh, part of the Water Framework Directive when we discuss the Baltic Sea area is also that the nitrates directive is integrated into the water framework directive. Um, the compliance with the nitrate directive is um, very poor. Um, and of course, that's also reflecting the problems that we have in the, uh, in the Baltic Sea area with effective measures on agriculture. The nitrates directive is a directive that controls the use of fertilizers and so on. So of course, that affects the um, status of the marine waters in the end. But why the water framework is also uh, very important is that it's uh, tied to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive that was adopted in 2008. And it's applicable to marine waters uh, and also have this uh, sort of cyclic review system. And one of the main points of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is of course this coordination with regional uh, agreements, regional uh, structures. So this is one of the, it's meant to be implemented to, through international organizations or international agreements in the different regional seas of the EU. And so this is one of the reasons that the Baltic Sea Action Plan also was adopted to be a regional implementation or a regional version of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So that says a lot about how closely tied together these frameworks are. And then again, the connection between the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the Water Framework Directive becomes important because uh, much of the implementation of the Marine uh, Framework uh, Directive will be implemented through the river basin plans for the Water Directive. Many states, and I think Halcom mentions this also in the um, reports, many states seem to believe that it's sufficient to only adopt uh, or implement the river basin plans and the um, measures identified within the framework of the water framework directive, but to be complying with the Baltic Sea Action Plan and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, really, if we go to the Baltic Sea Action Plan, implies that further measures needs to be taken. And this seems to be some kind of disconnect here between these uh, frameworks that perhaps is, um, I don't know if it's a lack of compliance or if it's just uh, a, a difficult with the coordination between these different perspectives. Um, but I'll go now for, the, this is also just a picture on this process that I think many of you are already familiar with this change of approach uh, that we've taken in the Baltic Sea Action Plan, um, where we assess the water quality, define the goals and set targets, and then go on in sort of a cyclic evaluation system. And this is a new approach, not only because it's focusing more on, on the ecosystem perhaps, but it also establishes uh, a monitoring system 
that makes uh, for a more of a continuous process of collaboration, which I think has been very important for coming forward with uh, taking measures, even though we're not all the way there. But I really wanted to skip next to the Baltic Sea Action Plan, because that's absolutely the core here and in a very important connection. It's also reflecting the system of uh, taking uh, national implementation programs of measures, uh, identifying what the states must do in order to achieve good ecological status. The Baltic Sea Action Plan is uh, to be reviewed again in 2021. We have not achieved the goal of good ecological status, even if we do not, uh, uh, even if we disregard the timeline that we know that we will see in relation to eutrophication. But uh, so will we arrive at a revised Baltic Sea Action Plan uh, very soon, which is of course also interesting to now start looking what has been what has been good in this process and, and what do we need to do more of in the, in the future. But what's also significant, of course, with the Baltic Sea Action Plan, and especially in its relation to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, is the targets for maximum allowable nutrient input. They're not binding. Um, and well, the whole legal status of the Baltic Sea Action Plan is something that one could perhaps discuss whether it's binding or not as well. But at least it was adopted through a very thorough process uh, in, uh, implying that it's binding to some extent. And um, whether they are binding or not is not so important because in relation to what I mentioned in the first part, these identifying relevant measures and so on, having these uh, nutrient targets and reduction targets defines very much what ambition level states must be at to uh, be in compliance and what what is required by the convention and with the Baltic Action Plan also additional recommendations have been adopted the plan has been reviewed a couple of times along the way and new guidelines with new measures and uh, recommendations have been adopted to help the states take further steps and now given the link to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and that the Marine Strategy Framework Directive has a similar goal and shall be applied also for the Baltic Sea states. This is why I mean that all these goals must also be reflected in the implementation and the requirements under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. But at the moment, it's not certain that this is really how the states um, interpret this uh, directive. Um, so this is how the maximum allowable input, um, nutrient input targets are formulated. Um, and they're focused first on the different basins and then divided uh, to on between the different coastal states. Uh, so because it matters in what area uh, the discharge um, goes. And in the end, we can see this last common column, which is the transboundary common pool. This is the states that are not part and not party to the convention and not coastal states, but that are part of the drainage area. And this is not an insignificant amount that that stands for. So when discussing effectiveness and compliance, one needs to take this also into account. And that's also why it's so important that HELCOM also has this uh, resource and the capacity to also direct uh, projects and programs directly to these states and also to Russia. Uh, this is the latest evaluation of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. The left column is common uh, or joint um, actions and this is the actions that states should do on their own. And here we can see the status of implementation. It's not Perfect. We're definitely not all the way. Um, um, but and I again, I was planning on taking some kind, of showing you some historical development. And so, even if this is not uh, a happy picture, given that so many states are not uh, fully complying with the Baltic Sea measures, um, the um, if we compare to how it was looking like 15 years ago, 
then we had almost no uh, consistent reporting on agriculture uh, at all and there was no progress in reducing pollution so in that perspective this is still a picture of success <laughs> i would say or at least a picture of progress um, so i'm gonna sum up i know i am perhaps a bit past my time uh, just a few more words more, more directly towards the issue of compliance and effectiveness here uh, and the role of law perhaps um, we have a new structure with these different frameworks directive and the baltic sea action plan and beside the ecological or ecosystem approach uh, that it brings it also creates a structure that creates for new incentives both because of this double incentives for all the eu member states but also because this structure uh, constructs a sort of a um, approach that in the theories of environmental law is called or international law is called the manier managerial approach to compliance and in my thesis uh, which i finished a couple of years ago this is very much a clear trend that i can see that this change in structure has helped the states to come uh, to take further steps um, and to um, be more compliant even if it's small steps uh, but for example in agriculture where it's been a lot of resistance to uh, comply with measures this um, helps the states to at least take small steps forward and of course the reduction targets also uh, is uh, important for making clear what states should do um, also just a picture here of the EU, the role of EU. Since the EU has a court system, uh, we could, I, I don't have the time to go into this perhaps, um, but the EU have reviewed some of these cases and the bottom line is that they mostly focus on the procedural aspects and have not taken a stand in this connection between uh, Water Framework Directive, Marine Strategy Framework Directive and their connection to the Baltic Sea Action Plan. It would be very interesting to see if the EU court would perhaps uh, do that in the future. And that would be probably a strong incentive for many states to take further measures. Uh, so just summing up on a little more happy picture, this is uh, the latest evaluation in 2018 from Helcom on uh, the maximum allowable inputs in the different Bay areas. And although there is a lot of red, there is also uh, progress and this also of course latest status reports shows that even though we're not all there it's really uh, going in the right direction seeing this peak where uh, the last the first uh, agreement started to um, uh, enter into force so uh, over the last couple of weeks, we have become experts on curves. So we see that this curve is sort of facing out, but at least it's going in the right direction. Uh, I wanted to stop on a tentative summary, but I think perhaps I'll just save these questions for um, the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Britta, for this very comprehensive and informative presentation. Really interesting. Now we will move over directly to Lara to make uh, a presentation about the Chesapeake Bay. Are you ready, Lara? Thanks for the opportunity to, to do this um, <clears throat> joint presentation. Uh, this actually in part stemmed out of uh, the opportunity that I had to be in Sweden this past year. We arrived in August of 2019 and left just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as Jonas mentioned, I was a, a Fulbright Scholar at Uppsala's University, Uppsala University's Peace and Conflict Research Department. But one of the first events that I did uh, in August of 20, or 2019 was to attend the uh, Baltic Sea Science Congress meeting in Stockholm. And it was quite interesting because as I, as I attended this and listened to try and figure out the players and what was happening and all the issues, I was really struck at how often you could have swapped out the word Baltic and put the word Chesapeake in for the types of issues that we were dealing with. So my focus here is on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, in looking at the attendees on this list, there are many people who could give this presentation uh, on what's happening in the Chesapeake. And I'm gonna give a very quick overview of sort of the evolution and where things have gone and talk about some of the current issues with a little bit of emphasis on Pennsylvania. Um, 
Um, this is a kind of iconic picture of the Chesapeake Bay, um, and a lot of the focus is on, on watershed restoration within the bay itself. Um, but it's also interesting as the conversation has shifted over time to shift from what's happening within the bay itself to what's happening in the watershed and how do you connect it. Efforts to restore this have evolved over a lot of time and it involves six states. The big three are Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia, and Maryland, but also contributing in the watershed New York, um, West Virginia, and Delaware, and then of course Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm sitting somewhere close to the S in the Susquehanna in the middle of Pennsylvania. I don't know where that is. Um, so currently in central Pennsylvania. Uh, law and policy on how to address the Chesapeake Bay has evolved over 40 years. Um, the key uh, law that's associated with this is the 1972 Clean Water Act uh, that put in place goals to make the nation's waters fishable, swimmable, and drinkable uh, actually by the 1980s. There's also a 1979 deadline to clean up any impaired waters. Uh, legally designated as impaired for a number of reasons. 1983 was the first time the Environmental Protection Agency first signed an agreement with Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. Um, within the Bay Area, there was an agreement uh, in 1987 that was revised to reduce nitrogen by 40 percent. Um, efforts to, to, to meet these requirements were underway, but in 1999, the American Canoe Association and others actually filed a lawsuit saying, hey, you have not uh, actually met these. Um, consent decree resulted from that a new uh, agreement in 2000 about how to get 40% uh, reduction of impaired waters um, off the list by 2010. 2007, we had an inspector general report basically saying, hey, progress is still not good enough. Uh, in 2010, the first ever total maximum daily load was established as a legal framework um, for the whole watershed, and I'll come back to that in a minute. 2014, a watershed agreement, and again, I'll, I'll cover each of these steps in a little bit more detail. There was a challenge about this uh, by the American Farm Bureau, a 2017 assessment, uh, 2019 watershed implementation plans, uh, phase three were due, and just recently, a couple of weeks ago, actually, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and others filed a 60-day notice of intent to sue. The ultimate deadline that folks are looking for is 2025. So while in the Baltic, um, the deadlines people are looking to to mark is 2021, I'm actually really struck by the similarity again in the timeframes. For the Chesapeake Bay program, again, it's 2025. And I'm gonna go through each of these points on this slide in a little bit more detail. 2010, the total maximum daily load, as Christoph noted, uh, this is meant to be how much reduction on a daily basis needs to take a copy of the very official and very long document. But this set in place legal requirements to reduce nutrients, um, uh, achieve standards for dissolved oxygen, water clarity, and chlorophyll A, and meet living resource goals. It was really what needs to happen across the entire watershed to meet these goals within the bay itself. Uh, it set basin-wide um, watershed limits and reductions of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and sediment. There is a change in, um, in terms here. Uh, it's million pounds of nitrogen, million pounds of phosphorus, and billion pounds of sediment per year. This equates to a 25% reduction in nitrogen, 24% reduction in phosphorus, and 20% reduction in sediment, again, across the entire watershed. This was then allocated to the states with the idea that they would figure out watershed implementation plans for each state within that on how to reduce those goals. Uh, there's been a number of watershed implementation plans over time. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency has sent out expectation letters in 2009, with the states then submitting their first phase one watershed implementation plan in 2010. Basically a blueprint for the states on how they're gonna meet their portion of that load reduction of nitrogen Phase two uh, was soon after, 2011, for the expectation level letter uh, submission in 2012. Phase three, and I'll, again, I'll come back to this in a little bit, the expectation letter went out in 2018, submission was in 2019. That's what states are supposed to be implementing right now. The key uh, phase three requirement was specify the programmatic and numeric commitments in order to have all the practices and controls in place by 2025 to achieve the final phase three nutrient incentive. Something I want to note here is it's not necessarily meeting all of the goals by 2025, but having all of the practices in place uh, 
by that time to meet those goals. Recognition that if you install a best management practice, it will take some time for the effects and the benefits of that to show up. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay program and organizational structure, um, laughing, we could do a, a comparison between the two different views of HELCOM and the whole European structure to the Chesapeake Bay program structure. Um, but this was put in place, Chesapeake Bay executive councils primarily, um, actually the governors of multiple states, principal staff committee, um, high level staff who are working on implementing this, um, speak to the management board, sort of the decision making core. They are advised by a citizens advisory committee, a local government advisory committee, and scientific advisory committee. I'm a member of, of STAC, scientific and technical advisory committee. Within the Bay program itself, there are a number of goal implementation teams, and I'll, I'll mention where those goals come from in a minute, but sustainable fisheries, uh, how to protect and restore vital habitats, protect and restore water quality, maintain healthy watersheds, foster Chesapeake stewardship, and enhance partnership leadership. There's also a, a group of agency representatives that are part of uh, STAR, which is the Science Technical Analysis and Reporting Group. And then all of those are actually supported by implementation groups. A little bit fuzzy on the bottom, but those green boxes. 2010, uh, and I'll come back to why I'm focused on this here in a second, but the American Farm Bureau and Pennsylvania Farm Bureau filed suit in federal court. The courts actually upheld the total maximum daily load. Procedurally, we had a, in 2013 a 99-page decision by Judge Rambo in the U.S. District Court for Central Pennsylvania, uh, basically upholding the Environmental Protection Agency's decision to issue the total maximum daily load. This was appealed to the Third Circuit. The Third Circuit upheld the case. The U.S. Supreme Court denied certiorari, basically denied review of the case, leaving the um, Third Circuit's decision to stand. Key findings really was that this total maximum daily load represented a lawful federal uh, Federalist program under the Clean Water Act, particularly given the amount of consultation and engagement that the Environmental Protection Agency did with all of the states and different stakeholders in developing the TMDL. Uh, public comment period was sufficient and the Environmental Protection Agency's modeling and use of data was available. Uh, 2014, the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement came to be uh, an agreement between all the states and the federal government to really provide more detailed principles, goals, and outcomes. I put the water quality uh, goal here, and the, uh, which is to reduce pollutants to achieve the water quality necessary to support the aquatic living resources of the bay and its tributaries and protect human health. The outcomes are pretty detailed um, by 2017 to have certain practices and goals in place. By 2025, have all of the practices in place. Um, water quality standards, uh, attainment and monitoring outcome continually improve the capacity to monitor, monitor and assess the effectiveness. Uh, so a number of different things. Um, each of the goal implementation teams that I mentioned is tied to one of these uh, goals within the uh, 2014 watershed agreement. 2017, um, and Christoph mentioned this at the beginning, uh, the midpoint assessment, basically where are we? Found progress, but need for more action. Christoph showed this picture earlier. Uh, they've recorded considerable progress, a record amount of acreage of underwater sea uh, grasses, the highest estimate of water quality standards attained in 30 plus years. But while 60% of the goals for reducing phosphorus in sediment as measured under the current suite of modeling tools were exceeded, the goal for reducing nitrogen was not met. There's also a little bit of a disconnect between modeling results and monitoring results. What are we seeing on the ground? And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Phosphorus runoff has been improving in many areas. This is a map of the entire bay. If you look at the darker brown areas, it's more delivered phosphorus in a particular area. Um, and you can see particularly in Pennsylvania in the lower right corner, um, that's an area of heavy production of phosphorus. It's a lot of agricultural farmland there. This is a little bit of a complicated schematic, but it basically shows the trend direction from 2007 to 2016. An improving trend is actually an arrow pointing down. A degrading trend is going up. The average load, um, the blue is lighter, yellow, um, sort of medium amount pounds per acre, and the red is a little bit more. So again, you can see that uh, southeastern portion of Pennsylvania um, degrading in phosphorus, uh, but a lot of trends in the right direction, uh, improving throughout the watershed. Not perfect, but headed in the right direction. 
Nitrogen is a little bit more complex pictures. The goals have definitely not been met. Again, you can see the sources of total nitrogen delivered across the bay and where those show up. And the same type of picture uh, showing average loads, um, the trend in improving, the arrows going down, degrading, they're going up. But the heavier loads are again down in that southeastern portion of Pennsylvania and right along the Maryland or uh, Pennsylvania border. Midpoint assessment examined key areas of regulation state by state. For those working in the Bay Program area, all of us have seen this graph over and over and over again. Um, what you see across the top is agricultural, suburban, wastewater trading and offset. Uh, what's happening here? And along the left, all of the different jurisdictions that are involved in the Bay Program area. And so in general, we have a lot of green of ongoing oversight, uh, and this is really meant for what should Environmental Protection Agency, who's delegated authority to the states to implement this, what should the EPA be thinking about? And you see particularly the two red areas um, backstop for Pennsylvania under agriculture and urban and suburban. Really relates to stormwater uh, and non-point source pollution for agriculture. Um, and so again, I'll come back to this in a little bit. I also want to pause and look at the enhanced oversight potentially needed for New York for wastewater. Uh, 2019 jurisdictions submitted their phase three watershed implementation plans. Basically, what are our plans for getting from where we are right now to 2025 and meeting those goals? The Environmental Protection Agency provided feedback. Um, example feedback, you know, if Virginia and Maryland fully fund and implement their plans, they can meet their targets. But they noted pretty strongly that Pennsylvania's plan has been underfunded by about $300 million and falls about 25% short of meeting its nitrogen reduction goal. I would note that Pennsylvania, for example, developed its watershed implementation plan based on a huge amount of stakeholder engagement and created pilot projects in four different counties to figure out how do we, what ideas can we uh, identify and what can we actually think we realistically implement. And so when, they, when Pennsylvania aggregated all of that and said, here's what we realistically think we can do for reducing phosphorus, nitrogen, and total dissolved solids, sediment, um, was that realistically as a state, we can, we can create enough uh, implementation plans to be able to hit 75% of that nitrogen target, 100% of the phosphorus target, and 100% of the sediment. Again, I'll come back to, to why that matters here shortly. Um, Pennsylvania, and I'm gonna focus on this. Um, this is an article headline from 2015, Environmental Protection Agency gives poor marks to Pennsylvania on protecting the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, a little later in 2015, more pollution flowing into the Chesapeake Bay Expected. Uh, so this has been a long-term set of questions. Why does it matter so much? Let me go back to this picture that I showed you at the beginning. Of the Bay watershed, um, more than 50% of the inflow of fresh water comes from the Susquehanna River. If you look at this again, Pennsylvania and New York, New York and Pennsylvania, a little bit of Maryland is where the Susquehanna River is. And so a huge driver in how do you address the watershed comes from what's coming from uh, the Susquehanna in particular. Uh, Pennsylvania already has the most number of impaired streams or stream segments in the United States. Um, this is impaired waters listed by state. There's a number of reasons for it. Um, agriculture, abandoned mine, drainage, stormwater runoff, and point sources like a, a wastewater treatment. So over time, again, um, the feedback that Pennsylvania got was basically you meet your numeric targets for phosphorus, but again, only 25, 75% for the nitrogen. If you look at a place like Lancaster, which is in that southeastern corner of the state, again, you can see the heavy focus on agriculture as the source of delivered nitrogen to a stream by the different sectors. The next highest would be developed, uh, developed land or urban stormwater. Um, this is from the EPA uh, phase three WIP evaluation. Uh, Pennsylvania's current planned efforts do not achieve the nitrogen phase three planning target, nor does the plan explain how or when additional reductions from the remaining county action plans will be incorporated into the broader plan to achieve the nitrogen planning target. A couple years ago, I have to say, um, during the 2017 time period when, it, when EPA, I think, realized that Pennsylvania was not able to achieve these goals. It actually withheld funding, grant funding for, for a while as the state was trying to figure out what to do. Um, the state modified its enforcement uh, approach 
and EPA released the funds at that time. So one of the questions that we had coming into this was what's the preparation, what's the enforcement mechanisms? Holding funds from the states was one, um, but part of the question comes, what happens if uh, implementation is not accomplished? One of the things that's happening in all the states is a huge amount of money and effort going into watershed restoration. But most recently, actually, instead of putting more money towards uh, implementation, Pennsylvania's lawmakers have basically passed a bill to freeze funding for county conservation districts, local parks, farm conservation, and so forth partly in response or entirely in response to um, budgetary impacts from the coronavirus. So this fight is continuing in Pennsylvania. Uh, other states, Maryland and Virginia, have actually put more money towards conservation and enhancement purposes. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, in May 18th, actually about 10 days ago, um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, together with the Maryland Watermen's Association and Arundel County, and then a couple of uh, Virginia cattle farmers, uh, sent one notice of intent to sue to the Environmental Protection Agency and the Attorneys General of Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Basic claims is the EPA has failed to ensure that these Bay jurisdictions will re meet their uh, pollution reduction commitments by the 2025 deadline, and it's a violation of the Clean Water Act, the Administrative Procedure Act, and the 2015 Bay Agreement. Particular targets uh, are Pennsylvania and New York. So, uh, I want to shift uh, a little bit. During this process, the Bay Program has identified several issues of considerable concern, non-point source pollution, um, diffuse sources coming from a number of different places, impacts of land use, growth, and development over time. Again, the red areas are the more urban or developed areas. Agriculture is in yellow, forest is in green, other is the water. Uh, Conowingo Dam is an interesting one. This is the lowermost dam on the Susquehanna River. Uh, and this really is affected by stormwater. I'll show you a picture of this here in just a moment. Um, in 2011, we had uh, both tropical storms, Irene and Lee, mobilized a huge amount of sediment. You can see the plume of sediment coming out of particularly the Susquehanna River. Uh, studies subsequently determined that the Conowingo Dam was effectively dynamically full. During a very high flow period, um, it would flush a lot of sediment. It was no longer acting as a sediment trap and flushing a lot of that down, which has raised a lot of question of how do you handle a dam that had been acting like a best management practice uh, and actually accomplish uh, sediment reduction behind it. We've also seen a huge amount of increased runoff. 2019 was the highest mean stream flow since 1937. Uh, and the just saturation of water coming through, again, raised considerable questions of sediment. I mentioned non-point source uh, as a really big challenging concern, but it also may be an opportunity. And I don't want to end with completely bleak news, but a little bit of hope from the bottom up. A lot of what I've talked about is the regulatory function top down, but we've also had discussions um, on how to address some of those questions in Pennsylvania. So going from more objective to a little bit of some of the stuff I've worked on here, I helped organize a conference in March 2016 called Pennsylvania in the Balance to bring together 100 plus stakeholders on how to discuss water quality in agriculture. And after three and a half days of really intense discussion about all of this, people didn't want to leave. Uh, I was really struck by this comment. Somebody said, somebody saying, we all feel like we can do this together for the watershed in the Bay. It feels really lonely that agriculture is in this alone and to blame for what has happened but a lot of appreciation for actually being able to talk through some of these issues. Um, folks identified a number of key themes on how to really address this from the Pennsylvania perspective, embracing a culture of stewardship, developing and deploying effective targeting of best management practices, integrating soil health, manure management, and riparian ecosystem stewardship into water quality strategies, thinking about community-based approaches, supporting a three-pronged approach to accelerate conservation, including things like technical assistance, financing, et cetera, thinking about incentive programs, and thinking about new uh, funding opportunities. The last thing I'll leave you with is a different project that we're working on uh, through Penn State and other places about how do you handle water for and from agriculture. And here we have uh, local leadership teams actually working to develop their own set of questions, but also potential solutions for addressing those, including two local leadership teams here in Pennsylvania. And again, it's been interesting to see how the top down, thou shalt do this, and the bottom up, what can we do about this approaches are starting to come together.
So with that, I'm happy to take questions and engage in the overall discussion. Thank you so much, Laura, and thanks to both of you for your very interesting uh, presentations. And um, listening to you, I think it, it, I have this, this feeling of, of um, that I often have as an environmental lawyer that there is some, some progress and, and, and some steps backward. So one step forward, some, one step backward. Both of you could show that there have been in some areas some progress, and there are also a lot of uh, ambitions and objectives that have not been uh, achieved. So before I open up for questions from participants, it would be interesting to hear if you could very briefly, based on what you have said, still point out how important in, in these in, in this ambitions and in these endeavors, how important is the law in the first place? And what role would you say that the legal frameworks may have, if it's impossible to say something about that? Is it, is it by regulating in a way that uh, the stakeholders follow? Is it by allocating responsibility and liability? Is it the monitoring? Is it rather the, the enforcement and implementation? What, what is it? If you, if you could somehow say how, how it matters for, for long-term um, cooperation and long-term work in these two uh, marine areas. What would you say, Britta? Um... Well, it's a little of everything, isn't it? Um, I think that I usually emphasize the, the role of law, not necessarily in its role as enforcing strict uh, requirements, but as especially in an international setting as a platform for cooperation. And you can always discuss compliance in whether states uh, adopt agreements because they're already wanting to take this kind of, of measures or whether the, the agreement and the obligation that this comes with is the force that makes states comply. And I think it's it's a, I mean, a, a, an interplay between both of these. So it creates a very important structure for cooperation. And of course, once obligated by a convention or in by EU law, states also then have further incentives to keep complying and keep taking measures, I think. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, even though we, I don't think we have had any case in the European Court of Justice concerning the Baltic Sea, there are other such cases concerning the Mediterranean showing the potential. So maybe that still is an incentive that the parties, the member states are aware that if they do not take some measures, they, they, may, they may be brought also to, to court. So before I ask Lara to comment, I now also invite you, those of you who participate who would like to say something, if you use you may know that there's a function on the Zoom that you can indicate by raising a hand that you would like to comment or put questions. And by doing so, you can also, you will then uh, be glad not to hear only me asking questions to them. So please indicate if you would like to, to comment or put questions. Now, Laura, what would you say in, in, the, in the Chesapeake uh, region? Yeah, I mean, I guess my instinct or my reaction to that is law is necessary, but insufficient. Um, so it's necessary as a, as a driver. Um, and you certainly look at how the states have allocated resources and money. Um, and there's there's been a lot of effort put towards fundamental conservation practices um, and the amount of um, can't even tell you. Try and you know when I when I moved to Pennsylvania in 2012 to just try and get a hold of the lingo and the the names of who was involved and the groups and it, it's astonishing, right? There's a tremendous amount of effort. A lot of this has been driven by how do we meet these requirements. But that said, you know it's also been striking to me when I've been out in some of the watersheds, for example, in Pennsylvania. If you go to a local watershed, even the one I live in, and say you know, what do you know about the Chesapeake Bay and its requirements? They're like, eh, we're not doing watershed restoration for the Chesapeake Bay. We're doing it because we have a world-class fishery here that we want to protect. And so that's been one of the disconnects is all of this effort at the federal and state level, but the locals, again, one conversation that really struck me a couple of years ago was somebody saying, yeah, I've never read these watershed implementation plans. And yet, if you want to see actual practices put on the ground, they have to go somewhere. You have to have local support for implementation on the ground, in the watershed, on a creek or a river. Um, 
And so how do you accomplish that and bridge that disconnect from thou shalt do this to, okay, we're trying to do this. And I think that's been a lot of the effort is, particularly in a place like Pennsylvania, how do you develop buy-in, uh, they're doing it county by county level, to actually get those identify targets of what they're trying to achieve and then get those practices accomplished. The frustration of states like Maryland or, or Virginia is, hey, we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're trying to do this and we're getting these practices done. Pennsylvania, A, you're not getting the things done that you need to at the rate you're supposed to, and B, now you're trying to defund these efforts. And I think that's where you see those 60-day notices of intent to sue come of you, you need money to accomplish this as well. Can't be that you've just committed to it as something legally binding. You also need the money to implement it. So law is necessary, but insufficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I guess you could say that with the board to see too, that it's necessary, but it is in, insufficient. So of course we heard by your presentation and also by Christoph that the, the, the uh, context are quite different. The, the scale of the, of the uh, water area is different. I, my impression when listening to you is that the distance, so to say, between non-state actors, between individuals or NGOs, or companies, the distance between them and the, um, the center for, for the cooperation in the Baltic Sea is, is greater. My impression is that there is more activity of non-state actors. You, you mentioned the cases where you, where there was the, what was it called, the, um, the Farm Bureau brought case to, to court and now there were NGOs um, active in suing the EPA. Is that the case that, is there something similar in the Baltic Sea in the, in the states around the Baltic Sea also where non-state non actors take such initiatives that you're aware of? You mean you know a little bit maybe of each one, so you, it, it's for both of you to see if you think that there appears to be a difference in the way non-state actors are involved in, in the governance of these areas. Uh, well, they're very present in the Baltic Sea, both, I think, on the national level, uh, although my focus in this has been more on the international level, but they've also been very significant, both in the development of the different frameworks, and not least in the development of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. They're very present in the negotiations in HELCOM and put a lot of pressure to the states but I think there's also a lot of initiatives going on on state level in all uh, the states around the Baltic Sea, absolutely. And, this, and the same is true in, in the Chesapeake. Um, the engagement of, of various nonprofits, um, non-state actors is tremendous. Um, the money, the time, the staff, the resources. If you look at the, uh, the goal implementation teams, if you look at the advisory committees and the schematic that I laid out, uh, there's a huge number of participants from across the spectrum, but it's also one of the one of the challenges. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I helped facilitate a discussion on how to how to more effectively accomplish what's in those goals. And there was a lot of frustration, for example, from the from the wetland goal implementation team, of people spending a lot of time dealing with the regulatory paperwork and compliance, but not enough time to actually make sure that, for example, wetlands are installed on the ground and functioning like they were supposed to. Um, the lament of one of the participants was, I'm a wetland scientist, and what I want to be doing is working in wetlands, not pushing paperwork. And so how do you accomplish and leverage the resources of lots of folks involved from all different angles in the way most effective to achieve the targets and goals without stepping on each other's toes? And I think that coordination is starting to take place um, more and more effectively in different areas. Again, Lancaster County in uh, southeastern PA uh, the Lancaster Clean Water Partnership, for example, is doing tremendous work to help organize and coordinate that whole sets of parties towards the goals that they're trying to do. Um, so lots of, lots of activity, um, but also a challenge. Thank you both. Now I have uh, two participants who have raised their hands and I first give the floor to Antti. I'm Antti. Östra Bagböle, Helsinki, Finland, Natural Resources Institute. Uh, so I have a question for both, both of you, and for both areas. So one of the concrete things uh, regarding governance and uh, nutrient pollution is the animal agriculture. And the 
the animal there's a there's a trend that the animal facilities are getting bigger and bigger and that might be something that we can't help but i i know that there's this uh there are technological solutions that could could come to help in these cases when the when the farms are really getting bigger and bigger and the manual problems are getting worse and worse because that, that also brings about the returns to scale. And I am aware that there was something going on regarding poultry industry in Delmarva Peninsula uh, on pelletizing manure. And, and that sounded to me like a perfect solution for uh, getting rid of the over surplus of nutrients. But I, I never really, I think I asked Don Bars this once in a conference, but I never quite understood that why is the regulatory pressure lacking for these large animal uh, operations, because there there are uh, uh, nutrient management plans for farmers, but these farms are run by contracts, and the contracts are owned by the operations, these large uh, poultry uh, meat houses, and the same thing in uh, in uh, in the Baltic Sea. The, so the environment is changing, the economic environment. The farms are getting bigger, and they are tied with contracts with these. Uh, per dual industries and these houses. So why not regulate these big companies instead of farms? Because then you could overcome the non-point problems uh, related to uh, uh, non-point pollution quite typically. So your thoughts on that uh, against the framework of the US regulation and against the framework of the Swedish or the Baltic uh, uh, and and in terms of Baltic, uh, bringing the Verzer Verzer ruling. Uh, so, what are the implications of that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antti. So, who want to start? Um, uh, I don't know if I have a satisfying answer. It was a quite complicated uh, question. Um, of course, I'm spon my spontaneous answer is that there should be some kind of uh, permit procedure for this kind of installations. And of course, that will be done very differently in different uh, states. Um, and depending on its uh, closeness to water, uh, the VESER judgment will, of course, also affect uh, the possibility to start farms like this. But perhaps, at least within the Swedish uh, framework, it would be a little more difficult to um, put more strict restrictions once uh, once it's up running. Although, of course, that's also uh, possible at some level within the Swedish law. But maybe, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer than that. I think. Okay. Thank you, Britta. So, Lara. Yeah, let me take a stab at that. And it's interesting because Ante and Don, I think we're thinking of the same things. Don Bash has raised a comment um, that I think matches this, which is in the chat, at least in the Chesapeake, there's an emphasis on funding shortfalls, assuming that public funding is always required. Uh, little evidence that considerable funding that controls agricultural diffuse sources has been that effective. Second, what about the polluter pays principle? And can regulatory requirements achieve more efficient results? when costs are internalized within the commercial enterprise. So you guys are thinking along the same lines. Uh, the Delmarva is an interesting one. The Delmarva is the peninsula that runs between Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Uh, and it is um, fairly flat. I went down there a couple of years ago and looked around like, wow, okay, sea level rise, <laughs> groundwater pumping means they don't have a lot of, of clearance. Uh, but it's also uh, home of the largest poultry production probably in the United States, in part because of easy access to the eastern seaboard and a pretty heavy duty market. Uh, interestingly enough there, one thing that has shifted is um, they, Maryland in particular changed its phosphorus index and how much phosphorus uh, and poultry litter, poultry poop, you could apply to land has shifted after they changed that P index. Basically saying, we already have a saturation of phosphorus in the soil high enough that the legacy of that coming off for year, will last for years. Uh, and so that shift in the P index to say, okay, you can no longer land apply poultry litter or other kinds of phosphorus inputs if you're above a certain threshold. I don't remember the precise numbers, but we can look them up. Um, has shifted um, sort of production patterns a little bit. Um, again, there's others on this call who can answer this probably in more detail. but it's that 
a poultry industry where some of the bigger animal operations are regulated under the Clean Water Act as confined animal feeding operations. One of the challenges is that we have had some of the CAFO uh, producers say, hey, we're already heavily regulated. Um, we are heavily scrutinized. We have a lot more permitting where a lot of the, the tension comes from is those who are smaller below that threshold for an animal feeding operation or a confined animal feeding operation. What's happening there? Uh, so it is a source of a lot of conversation. Um, you know, I think someone like Dawn does raise, how do you actually, actually. kind of um, incorporate that and incentivize it? So if I'm a poultry operator, uh, I own and kind of regulate from the chicken all the way up, but the producer who's running that is in charge of the poultry litter, the pollution that comes from that. And that's one of those disconnects where there may be a potential to kind of link that so that if I, as poultry producer, um, in an integrated uh, setting, own all of it, including the waste product. Right now that's a disconnect and it could be probably matched up. It's also a political challenge, um, I think bluntly, on how do you connect those questions. Uh, there is a pollution trading program in different states. Um, it's more or less effective depending on where you go. Um, in a place like Pennsylvania, we have one on paper, but I don't see a lot of active trades. Uh, so that may be another mechanism to kind of incentivize these kinds of um, matching the dilemma that we're addressing with the potential solutions. Okay, thank you both, uh, Britta and Laura. The next person who has flagged uh, or raised hand is uh, Sara Kimenvara. Let's see if we can have the, uh, her microphone unmuted and maybe also the video turned on so that you can put your question or make your comment. So now uh, yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, we can't see you, but we can hear you, so please. I'm connected with my phone, so I cannot put on oh, the uh, that camera. That explains why. Okay, um, please. Yes, um, I'm Sara Kimenvara, and I am uh, associated with the University of Eastern Finland and also a lawyer at the Swedish Environment Ministry. Um, I would like to ask, based on an initial comparative reflection on these both systems, maybe firstly to um, directed to Laura uh, about the US system, is it more, would you say it's more quantitatively driven? And I'm, I'm basing, basing this on, on the water quality standards that need to be developed by the states, based on which then the TMLDs are developed. Um, as in comparison with the Water Framework Directive and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which are basically um, qualitatively driven. So they have the, the descriptors in the annexes of the Water uh, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and then the, the uh, descriptive sort of definitions of what good status should be according to the Water Framework Directive. Um, and would you agree with me uh, that, that it's, it's more quantitatively sort of set up? I'm trying to think of how to answer that question. Yes, it is highly quantitatively set up. So for example, you know, if you're trying to reduce nitrogen by X amount, um, the Chesapeake Bay program in consultation with the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee has gone through and said, if you install riparian buffers, this will give you X amount of phosphorus reduction, this amount of nitrogen reduction, this amount of sediment reduction. And so there's expert panels that have reviewed each of the potential best management practices and what the potential nutrient reduction might be for each one. So you can go find that, you can look at all the expert reviews um, and see what those numbers are. But why I'm struggling a little bit with how to answer that, yes, highly quantitative, highly driven, um, Chesapeake Bay um, phase six model is actually a combination of models. It's multiple models looking at how all of these will come together. There's fabulous folks who work on implementing all of this and inputting all of these numbers. But at the end of the day, it still means you have to implement this stuff somewhere. Uh, that these practices have to go on the ground. And what's the actual reduction from any given practice, particularly given a lag time? One of the things I heard at the Baltic Sea Science Congress was we do these actions, how long does it take before we see a benefit? And oh, by the way, what's the impact of climate change more flood, more drought on these practices. That's where it gets a little bit harder to quantify. And where in the Bay program, there's a tremendous amount of modern monitoring. What do we actually see is happening on the ground? And there's a disconnect between the modeling numbers and the monitoring numbers. What do we think we should be seeing? 
looks fairly good. What do we actually see? Looks trending in the right direction, but less good. So there's a couple of disconnects driven by the numbers, but how do we actually meet and accomplish these things mm. is the subject of a lot of discussion right now. Um, just to follow up question on that, thank you. Um, it's actually also related, I would say, to uh, because in, in, according to the Water Framework Directive, we have to define our coastal areas into water bodies, whereas in the Bay Area, it seems that you have one large administrative area which should comply with this TMLD. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking that because I, in, the, in the Baltic Sea context, we are very concerned with uh, achieving the, sort of the um, good status in these different water bodies. Um, and why I'm asking the, the question on quantitatively driven, it would seem, I don't know if this is a premature logic, but it would seem that if you have smaller areas, you can achieve good local water quality. Yeah, and I think that's what's what's driving the conversation in Pennsylvania. And it's been really interesting, and I very much appreciate the shift. So I'm in Pennsylvania, right? And dead smack in the middle of the Susquehanna watershed. And there's been a shift over time where it used to be when we first moved here in 2012, we'd hear folks from the Bay Program come up and they'd be like, you should do all these things to help fix the Bay. Um, you know, we need to do these things to save the submerged aquatic vegetation and the blue crab and so forth. And people in Pennsylvania would be like, what? <laughs> Are we in the Bay watershed? You know, huge mm -hmm. disconnect. And over the last several years, the Bay Program staff have been really attentive, you know, to the point they'll come up and bring posters that are, here's what you can do to restore your watershed for you. And oh, by the way, it benefits the Bay and helps meet these legal requirements. So there's been a fundamental big shift in realizing that, for example, Pennsylvania or New York, to address these questions is really about local watersheds. You do this to benefit the local watershed and that benefit flows downstream. You run into the question of the Conowingo Dam um, because water quality is trending in the right direction all the way until the bottom of the watershed. And so how to deal with that has been an entirely separate conversation, but a part of this overall thing. Um, so it's a struggle on how to fully answer that. The, the numbers are definitely driving the conversation, but the implementation, as somebody else I think noted in the chat, has to be both incentives. Why do I want to do this? And the enforcement, what happens if I don't? So on, on okay. that point, thank you very much, Sarah, for your question. Uh, thank you. And, and Laura, uh, on that point, and maybe also for Britain, I think we, I see no further hands raised in the, on my screen. So. Um, I think you mentioned, Laura, and I saw also now in the chat forum the, the references to economic incentives, uh, or you can, you can have that, you can have sanctions, negatively, but you can also have positive incentives by funding activities and so on. And if I understood it, in the, in the Chesapeake region, there, is, there has been some of that, even though stakeholders are complaining that there is not sufficient funding. Is that both federal or, or is it at the state level? And then to Britta, I have never heard of any such um, incentives at the EU level or in, from the Baltic, uh, from the HELCOM level, economic incentives, why the different states may do so. But is there a discussion about that also in the Baltic Sea region to use economic incentives to change, move over activities to green, to, um, to, to take measures to reduce um, the um, amount of nutrients? Britta, why don't you go first? No. Uh, go ahead, Laura, you can you please. Okay, uh, short answer, um, just to make sure Britta has time is yes, it come, there's funding from all levels. It's directed in different ways. There's also funding from nonprofits um, and uh, an entity like NIFWIF, which is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, it is the largest kind of nonprofit most people have never heard of, um, but they, they put tremendous amount of funding towards, um, towards restoration activities. So we're getting money from lots of places. Again, how if I am a local watershed group and I want to implement things, it almost takes a full-time job to just know what grants are out, uh, and opportunities are out there. And that's been one of the one of the questions: is 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 that effective? Are there more effective ways to actually see management practices installed on the ground? Britta. Yeah, I'm sorry, do you mean uh, funding or do you mean using economic incentives? Well, to in, in either way, either that there is an opportunity to fund measures taken by whether it's farmers or municipalities in order to to, to uh, move into a more environmental uh, operation. Uh, 
um, if that has been discussed or coordinated somehow in the Baltic Sea Convention or at the EU level? Uh, I think both, that this is often discussed and that there is a lot of projects going on within sort of the frame of um, both the convention and within the cooperation in the EU and the EU Baltic Sea region, um, that there is a lot of funding um, for different kinds of measures to implement and to, to try new, uh, new measures and so on. But then, uh, and also at, I know in, in, at the national level in Sweden, there's been also this kind of, of projects to implement the Water Framework Directive, for example, funding farmers to um, make buffers for, um, for phosphorus and so on. But also, of course, there's been continuous discussions throughout these 40 years of also trying to make economic incentives through, for example, some kind of cap and trade uh, system. So that would be the most Mm -hmm. significant yeah. example of economic incentives on this international level. Yeah. yeah, but that's something we didn't have a chance to discuss and it would have been interesting to see whether some such measures have been taken in, in the US uh, to have a cap and trade system of nutrients. It has been quite much, quite uh, heavily discussed here. But we are getting closer to, to the end of this session. I think it has been very exciting. I think it worked very well uh, technically and I much appreciate your presentation. So I would like to thank in particular Britta Buman and Lara Fowler and also Christoph Humbro for your presentations. But there are also two persons that you haven't heard but who without whose support we haven't been able to do this and that is Isabel Stenson and Nastasha Ekeler who has contributed greatly to set up this uh, I think very exciting event.